Assalamualaikum everyone. Welcome to our second um, webinar um, or third seminar, sorry, um, in the Kalam series. And today we're going to be looking at the particular conversation of Dalqiq al-Kalam, Connecting Science and Theology. I am your moderator, Shweb Ahmad Malik. Uh, I'm, a, I'm an assistant professor at Zaid University in Dubai, and hopefully I'll be guiding you through this conversation. Uh, we have three interlocutors today. Our first speaker is going to be Dr. Basil Atta'i, and then we're going to have two um, follow-ups um, with Dr. Mahmoud Bulgan and Dr. Enes Doko. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud is going to be briefly speaking about or commenting on the Kalam side of things, and Dr. Enes is going to be speaking primarily on the science of, uh, uh, of the discussion. Uh, before I hand over to our first interlocutor, Dr. Basil Atta'i, I'd like to introduce him. So Dr. Mohamed al Thai is a professor of quantum cosmology at Yarmouk University in Jordan. He obtained his PhD from Manchester University in 1978. You can probably use that to guess his age. Since then, he worked on research problems in quantum cosmology and published about two dozen papers in peer-reviewed journals like Physical Review and the Institute of Physics Journals. Over the last 30 years, he's taught many courses on physics at the undergraduate and postgraduate level. These include quantum field theory, quantum mechanics, classical mechanics, statistical mechanics, astronomy, and astrophysics. He has published nine books in Arabic, mostly in science, and some in science and religion. Recently, he published his novel work, The Al Kalam, The Islamic Philosophy of Nature in Arabic, which will be published in English soon. And this is the premise of our uh, discussion today. Um, he has also co-authored, he, he has also authored two books in English called God, Nature, and the Cause, and the Divine Word and the Grand Design. Professor Ta is a member of the British Science and Religion Forum and has contributed several papers to conferences held by the forum. Some of his papers on the topics in the philosophy of science have been translated into Turkish and published in Turkish journals. He's currently working on research articles in science and religion from an Islamic perspective, which will be published by Kena Research and Media. So without further ado, I'll hand over my interlocutor, uh, Dr. Basil Ta'i, the stage so he can begin his presentation. Dr. Basil, uh, it's over to you, inshallah. Thank you, Dr. Shoaib, for uh, this introduction. Please uh, enable the uh, share screen so that I can make uh, the uh, presentation shared with the uh, participants. Okay, welcome all uh, participants. And I hope that I can give you a presentation which can sum up the scientific value of Daqiq al-Kalam, which shows the relation between uh, theology and science, Islamic theology specifically, because al-Kalam, al kalam as we know, uh, is part of the Islamic theology. What is uh, Islamic Kalam? It is a system of logic and a worldview based on fundamentals of the Islamic creed. Philosophically, Kalam is a collection of concepts, assumptions, principles, arguments that tries to explain the relationship between God, man, and the world in accordance with Islamic creed. The practitioners of Kalam are called mutakallimun. The methodology they followed is to uh, the mutakallimun is to start from the divine revelations from Allah to the mind and then to understand the world. This goes in uh, the opposite approach of the philosophers who start normally from the world, the physical world, and then they grasp or understand what's going on through a rational approach also, of course, to uh, understand or the metaphysics or Allah or God. You may notice that I sometimes write God and Allah depends on Allah refers always to the uh, uh, to God in the Islamic understanding. Kalam was a tool for deriving the fundamentals of Islamic jurisprudence uh, for, for quite a time. What is the Qiq al-Kalam? 
Oh, in Kalam we have two main trends. The first you can say is Daqiq al Kalam, which is which has constituted historically constituted a small part of the Islamic Kalam, and it is concerned with issues of natural philosophy, studies or views on space, time, motion, matter, force, etc. And then you have the large part of Kalam, Islamic Kalam, uh, which is Jalil al-Kalam. And this is concerned with the issues related to pure theology, mainly divine attributes, divine uh, attributes and the understanding or description of or, or fate of the hell and heavens, uh, resurrection of dead and the day of judgment, uh, the punishment and reward, uh, etc. All these topics falls under Jalil al-Kalam. Also, the creation of the Quran was one of the big problems of the uh, Jalil al-Kalam. Now, if we look at the legacy of Islam, Islamic Kalam, we find that most of the classical studies even nowadays, presenting Islamic Kalam uh, has emphasized the trend of considering the historical circumstances of Kalam, the schools of Kalam, the different views of uh, each uh, mutakallim, etc. Until now, this is going on in our universities and uh, our, our uh, uh, Institute studies in institute, uh, be it in the West or be it in the East. They concentrate sometimes on the debates uh, concerning theological questions also. All what we see presented now uh, is part of the, uh, actually of the old Quran. Rarely we find somebody presenting uh, the views of Mutakallimun about space, time, and nature. Other Orientalists uh, have presented Kalam studies uh, in a way looking for the Greek or Indian or Persian origins and resources of Kalam. And they have tried hard in their uh, books and their studies to relate Kalam, especially the Daqiq al-Kalam, which is concerned with natural philosophy topics, to relate it to Greek or Indian origins. We have actually two schools of Kalam. We should also mention this in the beginning. Now we have the Mu'tazila, which was uh, the first school formed uh, and was perhaps it was founded by Wasl ibn Ata, who died in 748 AD, uh, the second century after Hijra, actually. He lived in the first and the second century after Hijra. And followers were Amr ibn Ubaid who died 762, Abu al-Hudayl al-Allaf died 841, Ibrahim al-Nadlam 835, Adi al-Jahad is, is, is a friend and follower who, who, who died uh, 868, Abu al-Hussein al-Khayyata, etc. You, we have also uh, within the Mu'tazila, as you know, perhaps there are uh, other sub-schools like the Baghdadi school and the Basrian school, and they have different views concerning Jalil, mainly Jalil al-Kalam. Abu Hashim al-Jibai was one of the prominent uh, mutakallim. He is the son of Abu Ali al-Jibai, died 933. So as you see from the early century, 
from the 8th, 9th century, they have already had contributions in this uh, field. Also, we have biographers and historians, very prominent. They have done a great deal of work, like Qadi Abd Jabbar, uh, Abu Sa'id al Naysaburi, and uh, Al Hassan ibn Matawi. They have really good books, which has been discovered in the last. Uh, half century, and now it is edited and most of them are published. We have the second school, the second main school, the biggest school is Al-Ash'ariya. Al Al-Ash'ariya was founded by Abu al-Hassan Al-Ash'ari, who died 935, and uh, it's always said that Al-Ash'ari was in fact Mu'tazili, he was be subscribing to the Mu'tazila school, uh, but later he uh, devised his own approach. Uh, Abu Bakr al-Baqillani is one of the main uh, exponents of the uh, Ash'ariya, and he has done a great deal of work also in this line. He died in 1012 AD. Abu al-Ma'ali Juwaini is, is a great author and uh, he has also contributed a lot of uh, excellent monograph on Daqiq al-Kalam especially. Uh, most of his book, Al-Shamil fi Usul al-Din, is actually about subjects of natural philosophy. Abu Hamid al-Ghazali is a great mind I, I, I consider among Ash'arites, although he may not consider to be a very, uh, very Ash'arite in every sense, or uh, I mean to say he has certain uh, reservations about some uh, questions or problems uh, studied uh, within Ash'ari uh, school. Also, the, all these are, I consider, the uh, uh, early Mutakallimun. Maybe Ghazali is uh, somewhere in between, but then you have the uh, late Mutakallimun. My interest is in the early Mutakallimun, by the way. I don't pay much attention to the uh, early, uh, to the late Mutakallimun because I feel that there is a difference. There is a, some sort of gap between the two. And I feel that, uh, uh, after uh, uh, or starting from Fakhruddin al-Razi, Kalam took the direction of uh, Islamic Kalam, took, uh, was muddled in my opinion with philosophy, and there were some arguments of philosophy which has uh, leaked to the original Kalam approach, and therefore uh, I, I don't consider uh, this uh, late Mutakallimun to be uh, expressing the original views of, of Kalam, no matter whether they, they perhaps they, they have a good views in certain areas, explanations, etc. Then we have the third school, which is Al Maturidi school, and uh, I should apologize for not being. Uh, 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 well done this, uh, delved into, into this uh, uh, studies of Matiridi school because I found that they don't have much to say about uh, the uh, topics of natural philosophy. Then we come to, we should also mention the calamity of Kalam. Kalam has suffered a lot. Islamic Kalam was a project actually in the starting from the second century after Hijra and third century and fourth century after Hijra. Islamic Kalam was a great project to start with, but unfortunately it was indulged with sensitive topics, uh, metaphysical questions and uh, especially the divine attributes and the question of the creation of the Quran, which has caused a lot of harm to the uh, approach and to the views and to the people even 
uh, and has created the problem between the fuqaha and the mutakallimun, which culminated, as we know, uh, with the claim of Mu'tazila that the Quran is created, while fuqaha and Ahlul Hadith, uh, the Hadith, uh, th those who are scholars of Hadith, say it is Kalamullah. We cannot say it is created or not, or so this. It is Kalamullah, wal Kalamu Sifatul Mutakallim. The word of God is the same as, uh, have the same power of God. Debate on this subject turned into conflicts and caused turmoil in the Islamic world, especially in Baghdad. Uh, by the time of the Khalifa al-Mutawakkil, the Mu'tazila faced troubles from the ruling regime. By the way, it was, I mean, al-Ma'moon and his son al-Mu'tasim, they encouraged Kala strongly. But then when al-Mutawakkil took power, he, the Mu'tazila tries, uh, suffered, suffered from uh, prosecution. The biggest prosecution came at the time of Khalifa uh, al-Muqtadir Billah, uh, around 420 uh, after Hijrah. Uh, al-Muqtadir Billah issued uh, a legislation or a, a order uh, of several pages in which uh, it, the, the the proper Islamic creed or basis of Islamic creed were uh, written and it was read in uh, many mosques for ages, for, for tens of years. And that, by the way, when, when I read Sahif uh, al-Qadriya, Sahif al-Qadr Billah, I uh, recognize that our present uh, Isla Sunni Islamic uh, view uh, or creed is based on that Sahif al qadriya My project is to uncover the trend of Islamic Kalam, which deals with topics. So first, we deal with topics of natural philosophy, which is called Daqiq al-Kalam. The new approach is based on, a, on the basic principles of uh, Daqiq al-Kalam, uh, and I feel that this flourish, uh, this this will furnish, this will furnish actually after we 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 get people interested in this field, if many people will be starting working on this daqiq al kalam in serious research, uh, they would uh, furnish the basis for a new approach that revolves revives the genuine uh, trend of. Uh, rational consideration of belief uh, and to express uh, new views following uh, nearly the same approach uh, which I will talk about. The new approach now we have is to, as I said, so we have two stages in my project. The first stage already I have written a full book about it, which is Daqiq al-Kalam, the Islamic approach to natural philosophy. It has been printed in Arabic since 2009. And in 2016, the second edition of this book in Arabic appeared, but now uh, it is translated in English awaiting to be published. Uh, the second stage is to devise the platform for a new Jalil al-Kalam, which I hope will be uh, uh, different from the old Jalil al-Kalam and the old conflicting views, etc. My project do not seek to present Kalam in its, as I said, in the, I should stress this point, uh, in its historical context. Rather, it heads for utilizing valuable wealth of knowledge uh, of Daqiq al-Kalam uh, to formulate the Islamic approach to science and religion. Uh, 
The project is now at the stage of, as I said, of laying the bases and uh, we can uh, move forward. Now, what are, what, what, what's the Qiq al-Kalam? I started, by the way, to tell you my interest in these studies in 1989, about 30 years ago. Actually, I started studying, not only reading, studying uh, the books of Mutakallimun. And from that studies, uh, within about four years, I was able to uh, uh, collate the uh, basic principles of Daqiq al-Kalam. Maimonides, Musa ibn Maimun, in his book, A Guide to the Perplexed, uh, he uh, suggests that uh, the principles of Kalam are 12 doctrines or principles, 12. Uh, items. I found that I can uh, collate all these, uh, even 12, into removing some of them, which is Jalil al Kalam. I end up with five principles of the Qiq al Kalam. And these five principles are first, tem uh, the first one is temporality, second, atomism, third, recreation, fourth, indeterminism. Fifth is the space-time integrity. I find that these constitute the basic basis of for the world view and substratum for the analysis. First temporality, what do we mean by temporality? Hudouth. In Arabic, hudouth. It says that everything has a beginning. Everything in, in this physical universe must have a beginning. I, I'm not going to go through the details of the argumentation and proofs uh, because uh, the, the time for, given to me is also limited, but I will just present the main concept and the theological basis, which is important here. Mutakallimun construed their principles basically from the Quran. Everything nearly of the five, uh, four, four of the five principles has direct relation to the uh, uh, verses of the Quran. At our modern time, William Craig, the philosopher, has restated the Kalam cosmological argument, as you know, in 1979, in his uh, small book about the Kalam cosmological uh, arguments. But this is only one, one principle. Practically, or as, as far as uh, the real situation uh, is concerned, our modern cosmology, as, as we know, stresses the fact that the universe has a beginning. Nowadays, and uh, since uh, about two decades, the idea of cyclic universe came into uh, play, and people thought that this means, a cyclic universe means that the universe is eternal. It is not. Because if you study the cyclic universe in details, and I myself has worked on one of this, uh, one version of the uh, cyclic universe, uh, and I found that it is not, not uh, the same, the universe changes from one cycle to another. It goes, uh, fades away, becomes a singularity or new singularity, and then it blows up in a new Big Bang. And this is important. So it's a new universe. It's not eternal. The second principle is atomism. Simply, it says that everything in the world is discrete. Everything. Matter, motion, uh, space, time, everything is discrete. Uh, it assumes finite divis divisibility, of course, of the 
of anything, uh, which will end up, according to the Mutakalimun, if you go on divi dividing uh, any object, it will go on uh, to uh, we end up with the, with the Jauhar, which is called uh, in the Western literature, essence, and the Arab. They, they proposed, and here is the, uh, the important point, very, very important point. When you divide any uh, a small piece of thing or a large piece of thing, you end up after billions of divisions you make, you, you, you can say you end up with the, the uh, non-divisible parts, according to Mutakallimu. This non-divisible part is not the uh, 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 is not viewed on vi uh, envisaged as it was envisaged in the Greek uh, philosophy. Democritus, for example, it's not uh, why because now we have two parts: we have the Jauhar and we have the Arab, and this is important. Uh, this non-divisible part, a juz الذي لا يتجزأ, is the atom. And many of the uh, scholars now, uh, researchers, they think that the Jauhar is the Islamic atom. And they, when they write their uh, research work, etc., they say Jauhar means Islam the atom. It's not the atom. The Jauhar is part of the atom, actually. The Arab is an important part of the atom. And the Jauhar cannot be realized without the Arab. Never. The Jauhar, in fact, is a sort of abstract entity. That is why uh, uh, Frank, uh, Richard Frank pointed out that the Jauhar is not equivalent, exactly equivalent to the essence. And the Arab is not exactly equivalent to the, uh, to the accidents. This point I bring here uh, po wa was pointed by, by Frank Griffel in his review of the th three volumes of Richard Frank. So we should understand this. Uh, the, the, the atom, Islamic atom, is the al juz الذي لا يتجزأ. That is the Islamic atom. It's not the Jawhar, it's not the Arab. It is the Jawhar plus the Arab. By the way, time is also discrete, according to Mutakalimun, and this is new to, the, to, to our modern physics now. The rest is okay, accepted. Everyone knows now that we have, I mean, atoms, etc. The third principle is recreation, and this is one of the most important principles of, of Daqiq al-Kalam. Theological motivations for this was that Allah is the sustainer of the world and Allah creates the universe, uh, creates things and recreates them. As I said, everything, every principle you want, there is uh, uh, pointing to, for example, even atomism. Uh, some of the mutakallimun, they say, we have taken this from the, including Ash'ari, so it seems, yes, that they, they have construed their uh, uh, principles under the influence uh, of the Quran. So here, when it says, it's, it means that uh, Allah should recreate. And this is very useful for the th from theological point of view to... Uh, Reinstate always the position of the Creator, Allah, to have Him, to have Him as a sustainer of the world. Doesn't stop. His creation never stops, and this is a very important point. As they say, so how do they recreate things? How do they recreate the atom? They say the atom is Jawhar and Arad. The Arad never stays two moments, two successive, never stays two successive moments. So that is why 
the recreation actually happens on the arz. In modern terminology, I will, as I will show, the arz is the observable, the observable of the physical system. If you work on this recreation, uh, you will find that it implies inherent uncertainty on measuring complementary observables like position and momentum. It does. It does. It does. You won't get. Uh, you won't get with further assumption. You won't get uh, Heisenberg uncertainty principle, but you will get the the uh, principle that uh, there is always uh, minimum uncertainty in these variables. This implies that the laws of nature are are indeterministic. And this could explain for us the problem of measurement in quantum mechanics, as I will show. As I said, indeterminism is, comes from recreation. Indeterminism, again, is from theolo theological point of view, is very important because Allah is the supreme, is the supreme creator, and he 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 has absolute free will, he can do anything, he is omniscient, omnipotent, and this has to be uh, uh, valid in the, uh, in the work of nature. Innate things in the world have no intrinsic power, according to Matakalimun, uh, or will, or intention, and I think logically this is logical. Laws of nature needs a sustainer. Where do we get this from? From quantum mechanics. Laws of nature are the phenomena, by the way, and here also I want to make a distinction, differentiation between laws of physics and laws of nature. This is not in the Western, uh, uh, in Western uh, contemporary uh, philosophy of physics, they don't make a difference. Uh, all physicists like Stephen Hawking, Paul Davis, etc., they write laws of physics and they mean laws of nature. And they are laws of nature and they mean laws of it. Laws of nature are the phenomena without any specification uh, concerning the expl or explanation, any specification of the causes, etc., and any detail about the mechanism. The phenomena as itself. Fire burns cotton, full stop. This phenomena is a law of nature. But when you talk about molecules getting excited with higher energy, etc., etc., this is physics. This is law, law of physics. When you describe it this way, it's a law of physics. It's important for us Muslims to make these differentiations. And uh, if you look at it this way, then you will see that quantum mechanics is telling you that laws of nature, that is the phenomena, are indeterministic, and therefore they need a sustainer. More than that, the diversity of the, of the world with, with, with having uh, indeterministic uh, laws of nature will need coordinator. Uh, more than that, quantum mechanics tells us that everything is contingent. Every, every solution of the, uh, of the Schrodinger equation psi, uh, has probability, certain probability. And it is not always that the highest probability will act or work. Sometimes low probability events occur and sometimes very low probability events occur like the uh, formation of oxygen inside the sun uh, by having three uh, helium atoms uh, combining with the fourth one and turning into oxygen. <laughs> 
And this very low probability event is, is hard to understand unless there is some kind of, a, it's contingent, yes. Quantum mechanics has told us that physical observables are contingent. Uh, and every physical system, an electron is a physical system, will have, as I will show in a moment, will have many other uh, sta states which are con contingent. Under continued recreation, uh, uh, this complementarity between observable will, will, the, will appear. The fifth principle is the principle of space-time integrity. Most of the mutakallimun has treated space and time on equal footing. For example, read Ibn Hazm in Al-Fisal, uh, uh, Milal uh, Nihal. He clearly says that uh, we have a different opinion, different uh, concept for space and time uh, as compared to the philosophers. Al-Ghazali, in his book, The Incoherence of the Philosophers, he has already uh, talked about uh, space and time in some details, by the way. And he has also talked about the, uh, the time as a dimension, as a dimension. Uh, it is translated in, uh, in English, extension, correct. But in Arabic, it is بُعْد الزَّمَانِي فالبعد الزَّمَانِي لا يختلف عن البعد المكاني That's what he's saying. Uh, so, in his uh, thought, and the, in here, I don't have any theological basis, actually, but I found that this integrity between space and time is... Uh, is deeply rooted in Arabic culture and Arabic language also. And if you read the book of Al-Jurjani, Al-Tahrifat, and you read the tarif, uh, the, the definition of Zaman, you will see uh, what does it mean to have space and time getting integrated in such meanings. Now we have these five principles. What can we do with them? Oh. They are a very useful tool to consider uh, uh, questions, problems, analyze the problems of natural philosophy. Also, if we can develop a new a new Jalil al Kalam, we can establish full platform to analyze social, economic, political, religious, and all other aspects of life. Here I will give some examples. So you see the, uh, you will see that the, the, the studies in Kalam, in the new Kalam, I call it, the new Kalam, is not uh, something of uh, pure academic interest. It is subject for applications. The first point is the discreteness of time. First example, in by the way, perhaps I have to stress again that the five principles which I mentioned before 1900, if you ask any physicist and they say, I have these five principles, he would say, you are talking nonsense before 1900. But from 1900 onwards, after the quantization of energy and uh, atomism, etc. They will discovery of the atom, etc. And the five principles and after the special uh, and the theory of relativity, the special theory of relativity, the five principles are of mutakallimun in daqiq al-kalam are perfectly in conformity with the modern physics, with the, with the, with the principles of modern physics quantum theory and relativity. And that is what, what inspires me to uh, chase uh, these principles and put them into work, utilizing them in such problems. For example, as I said, discreteness of time. Until now, we don't have 
a theory for discrete for for discreteness of time in physics. We have many other people working now, and many papers has been published in the last thirty years, by the way, about the discrete time, especially when it comes to the question of quantum computing, etc. But since the early Mutakallimun time. Uh, the, uh, since the early Mutakallimun time, uh, they had the view that time is discrete. al nawam has considered discrete motion by his uh, suggestion of Al-Tafra. Uh, uh, Max Hiemar, uh, uh, the modern, uh, the contemporary philosopher of quantum uh, theory, uh, in his book, The Philosophy of Quantum Mechanics, he says al nawam was forerunner for quantum theory. The second aim is the investigation of possible utilization of this notion is in, in quantum gravity, contemporary psychology, for example, consciousness, and even parapsychology. If we can have a clear understanding of discrete time, many things will change in a practice. The other question is causality or problem. It is mostly misunderstood in, in the history of Karam. When you, whenever you read books of Arabs or, or Europeans about causality, they say, Mu'tazila believed in deterministic universe, etc., etc and the Ash'ari are not uh, are occasionalist, etc., etc. It's not true. They say uh, Al-Ghazali do not believe in causality altogether. Mutakallimun, uh, Ash'ari do not be believe in causality. It's not true. <coughs> if you go in details, you see that there is a lot of confusion, but you can see that, in fact, Mutakallimun do not deny causality altogether. They deny deterministic causality. And there is a difference between deterministic causality and causality. Causality is causal relationships plus determinism. This is the classical causality. Now we have a quantum mechanics. What can we do with it? A quantum mechanics overrules the classical causality by, by, uh, by, by deleting, by, by negating uh, in determinism, uh, uh, classical determinism. And all we know that causality in quantum mechanics has a different shape. So if we have to put things right, we should put it this way, that we have causal relationships, which is very well acknowledged, even by Abu Hamid al-Ghazali in his book, Incoherence, read the pages uh, where he talks about causality, and you will see he acknowledge causal relationships, but he doesn't acknowledge, he call it Iqtiran, this is one kind of causal uh, causal relationship, Iran. Uh, Al Mu'tazila, by the way, have four types of causal relationships, but they, but they don't acknowledge determinism. They have Atimad, Iqtiran, Tawlid, and Mustaqar Hada. Ash'arites have one type of causality, which is Mustaqar, causal relationships, sorry, which is Mustaqar Al Hada. Or Ada. And by the way, I read somewhere that uh, Al Ada, I think Frank Griffin mentions that it is the uh, custom of God. It is not custom of God. This is the custom of nature, not of God, or our understanding. Uh, and I, I have shown that uh, in proof. When it comes to uh, uh, details, we can discuss that. This concept needs to be investigated and analyzed in view of modern concept of causality in classical and the quantum physics, I believe. 
The third problem, which is very important, is the problem of measurement in quantum mechanics. This is a very, very important problem prevailing now, until now. Quantum mechanics has showed that physical observables in the microscopic world may have many contingent values. By observable, I mean anything which you can measure. This is observable. Position, momentum, time, whatever, this is observable. Uh, each with different probability. So for every physical system or entity, quantum mechanics in the micro microscopic world says there are many contingent values, not like classical physics. We have one value. We have many values, each with different probability. For example, position and momentum of an electron. Also, it is assumed and it is assumed, I should stress that, that when an electron is not observed, it would exist in all those contingent positions in a sort of superposition. And this assumption has led to problems, by the way, to paradoxes like the Schrodinger cat paradox, and the einstein podolsky rosen paradox. This problem of measurement has several interpretations, of course, but to mention a few, we have the Copenhagen interpretation, collapse of the wave function, we have the many world interpretation, multiverse, and we have the einstein bohn interpretation. None has a final answer and none is free of loopholes. I believe that the recreation proposal or hypothesis, let us call it, of Mutekellimun can have a place in uh, this area, in this uh, topic, and can propose, uh, could be a convincing solution. I have written a paper which is published in archive uh, and uh, also published in another version in some uh, science and religion debate books uh, or conferences, uh, proceeding of the conference on uh, science and religion by the uh, British, uh, British Forum uh, in 2009 already. So, uh, one can go to the, and now I am detailing, of course, this theory of, of uh, now I am calling it a uh, theory of, of recreation. The fourth example is biology, biological evolution. The Qiqal Kalam has something to say about biological evolution and Darwin's theory. I'm sorry, I am only giving you an overview. I don't want to get to details because I, I, I would like to present my project as an overview, not rather than giving one topic. Otherwise, one problem of this will take uh, more than one hour lecture. So in biological evolution, I find that since all changes in nature, according to Mutakallimun, is taking place through recreation process, in this process, new observables appears out of many contingent ones, each having certain probability to occur. Since low probability observable appears sometimes, we are obliged to assume that some agency, which must be, by the way, outside the physical world, is choosing which observable must appear. An agency which is outside our physical world, and I will tell you why it is outside our, is choosing which probability to occur. Sometimes low probability is occurring, very, very low probability. As I said, why, why it has to be outside our physical world? Because if it is part of our physical world, if it is another law of nature, a super law of nature, for example, then it will follow the same restrictions, the same, 
it, it has to be indeterministic again. And it, it would need a driver. So that's why it is it has to be something of different type. An agency, I don't know whether it is Allah or God or whatever. An agency has to has to play with these probabilities. And uh, many physicists, including uh, our uh, professor uh, who wrote The Mind of God, has stated that some agency has to be uh, uh, has to have a role in the early beginning of the universe. Of course, they always admit that the initial conditions for the creation are unknown. The Qiqal Kalam, by the way, I find favors adaptive mutations, not random mutations. So evolution is correct, but evolution According to Kalam, yes, natural phenomena sustained by the sustainer and it has to be uh, to follow adaptive mutation, not the random mutation. The next step, in my opinion, is to lay down the Jalil al-Kalam. If we can give, I have, by the way, tens of problems, tens of problems to be studied by postgraduate students from theological background and from science background. And I was dreaming 10 years ago or more to, uh, to have an institute which takes students from both uh, streams, from physics and from theology. Uh, and we uh, have an institute of Karam which uh, uh, study these problems. As I said, I have tens of problems. I can lay, write the title and the plan of a study for 30, at least 30 uh, main big problems, which can go and publish decent original papers. Uh, but all, of course, I have to give the theologian a course or uh, a couple of courses on, on, uh, on physics. And I have to give the physicist and chemist on mathematics also a couple of courses in, in Arabic and in uh, theology and, and the way theologists think in order to achieve such a, such a, such a name. It is a genuine, it is a genuine proposal indeed, but I could find no uh, strong, uh, strong supports. New Jalil al-Kalam in my view, Jalil al-Kalam now, is it due once we uh, cover the understanding of Daqiq al-Kalam and establishment of Daqiq al-Kalam, our methodology and resources of jurisprudence are in need of such a development now. We no longer need the old Kalam. We are not going to recreate again to re we represent the uh, debates about the divine attributes and the metaphysical uh, questions. In my opinion, all uh, questions about divine attribute, metaphysical question, Jannah, Nar, etc., uh, has to be taken from the Quran as it is. Islam is Taslim. Iman is Taslim. All the these ghaybiyat, all these. Uh, has to be uh, taken from the Quran and not from the studies of others. Or we need to introduce science in our Sharia. Otherwise, we will be outdated, you know. And time is running, by the way. Every year is running now uh, in a scale of 10 years, uh, 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 half a century ago. Every, every year is running at a scale of 10 years half a century ago, in every respect, even in social studies and religious studies. And we have to, uh, science should enter our Sharia from the, uh, from the gate of Islam, of the genuine Islam. This is very important. Uh, 
the, the qualified gate I find is Daqiq al-Kalam. Because Daqiq al-Kalam has established already bases in modern science, in modern physics. So I can now establish Jalil al-Kalam on such bases and give problems, studies, and see trial studies sometime we have to make and to see whether we can uh, do the right thing or not. Of course, Jalil al-Kalam has to take into consideration it is Sharia. It is basis of the Sharia. So it has to take the Quran directly because Daqiq al-Kalam does not take the, the Quran directly. I can discuss Daqiq al-Kalam with any re other religion not necessarily referring to the Quran. I don't need to refer to the Quran at all. It is a rational approach. But when it comes to Jalil al-Kalam, no, I have to refer to the Quran and Hadith and, and the, the narration of the Prophet Muhammad in the Jalil al-Kalam. But the Jalil al-Kalam is not my job, Muhammad Basil al tai I cannot do that. It is people who are from uh, divinity department from theology uh, school ilahiyat they can do the job properly and they can lay the basis of uh, uh, Jalil al-Kalam uh, properly uh, which I hope that they will do uh, in what remains in my life uh, to see this uh, trend flourish. Thank you very much for for uh, listening to and attending this uh, webinar and I hope I'm sorry if I have exceeded a, little, a bit of my time but it's important to give full view uh, I should uh, in this occasion take this occasion to thank many people in Turkey especially uh, Elias Shelebi Professor Elias Shelebi and uh, Dr. Bulgin and many others who encouraged teaching my, my book Daqiq al-Kalam in, in the Divinity Department or Ilahiya Department at Marmara University and other universities I know in, uh, also have taken this initiative. But I want to present this in English now and I hope uh, that this book will be published in English uh, and also Turkish to be uh, a textbook for new uh, generations. Thank you very much indeed.